Welcome to SITSI Oz Online. Um, this is an initiative of the Australian Citizen Science Association, or AXA for short. Um, my name's Emily, and on behalf of the conference, the whole conference committee, uh, I want to welcome you to the second instalment of uh, SITSI Oz Online. Uh, we want to thank you for your interest in citizen science and for your attendance today. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled that we can still celebrate citizen science despite some of the new challenges that we are facing today. Uh, so I'd just like to give an acknowledgement of country. Um, we would like to take this opportunity uh, to pay our respects to the traditional owners and the ongoing custodians of the land on which we work and live, the Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islander people. We recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I also want to introduce all of our sponsors because without them, this event would not be possible. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you to the Theo Murphy Initiative of Australia. So through this initiative, the Australian Academy of Science conducts up to four activities and events annually to support Australia's early and mid-career researchers, or EMCRs. And the purpose of these activities is to provide tangible benefits to EMCRs and to support their careers and ultimately further citizen science discovery. So I don't know if you, any of you were able to log in last week to our EMCR session, but it was absolutely great. And we had some amazing speakers talking about um, emergence and citizen science. Next, I would like to thank the Mindaroo Foundation, the Fire and Flood Resilience Initiative. So the Mindaroo Foundation is a modern th th philanthropic organization, which takes on tough, persistent issues with the potential to drive massive change. The Mindaroo Foundation is independent, forward thinking and seeks effective and scalable solutions. I would also like to thank the Environmental Institute of the University of Adelaide. So the Environmental Institute brings together leading research groups at the University of Adelaide in the fields of science, engineering and economics relating to the management and use of natural resources and infrastructure. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Australia's first museum, the Australian Museum. The Australian Museum's Centre for Citizen Science programmes provide a very important source of data about bi biodiversity. Data and insights gained through the efforts of citizen scientists enable scientists to learn more about environment by creating additional data sources. So once again, AXA extends a huge thank you to all of our sponsors because without them, we could not have this conference and none of this would be possible. So thank you once again. So now I'd just like to go over a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our speakers. So you will have noticed when you've logged in that your microphones and your videos are disabled. Uh, so please keep that way throughout the session um, just to make uh, have respect for our speakers and reduce any disturbance in their presentations. I also want to warn you that this session is, be, is being recorded and that it will be made available on our YouTube at a later date. So that's another reason to keep your videos, uh, keep your videos turned off and re remain anonymous if you would like to. Um, all questions will be asked at the end in our Q&A session, but you can ask them throughout the session uh, using the chat function. Erin will be keeping an eye on that uh, throughout the session and uh, she'll be, so she'll be aware of what questions are being asked and we'll get to them at the end. And we really encourage you to ask questions. That's why we're, uh, you're logging in live and in, in the spirit of citizen science. So please, please get involved, we'd love that. So once again, this week's theme is disaster response. Um, we'll have three speakers, uh, last around 15 minutes each, followed by the Q&A session and then we'll have a 15 minute break and then we'll have a bonus resilience session which will go on afterwards. I'd like to welcome our first speaker and that's Julia. Julia Kumari Drapkin is the CEO and founder of IC Change. Welcome Julia. Thank you so much to AXA for hosting me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. All right. Excellent. Okay, well, again, um, I'm uh, Julia. I'm the CEO and founder of IC Change. 
Um, I actually, um, a little bit about myself, um, I have a background in anthropology. Uh, so I was out in uh, doing field work when, in high school. So doing kind of citizen science fields is very natural and innate to me. But I spent over a decade reporting climate, all, uh, climate change all around the globe. Um, I'm a Gulf Coast native, and but most importantly, I'm a mom. Um, and, I'm a, and the IC Change team is an incredible team um, that it spans the world. Um, who helps to build our platform and support our community. I will do a little throw to uh, the work that I was doing before I started IC Change. This is an assignment I had in the, the Anam um, lands in the Northwest Territories. Uh, but this was before I had a child. <laughs> and it really truly grounds my work to think about all the information and insights we gather for the next generation. So I appreciated that call um, and honoring in the beginning here. Um, so IC Change, what do we do? Um, so IC Change, it, our mission is to connect people to each other and their changing environments to make solutions together. Um, some people call us citizen science, other people call us a kind of a, a resilience platform. And our, we are very mission oriented. We are crowdsourcing and analyze community microdata about climate impacts to inform solutions like project planning, infrastructure design, but what we're really doing is connecting people through their stories. Um, people use our platform to mobilize communities around stories, photos, and weather measurements that are impacting their daily life. And, and really we're trying to create a dialogue um, neighbor to neighbor, city to city, country to country uh, around the world. Um, in many respects, uh, we have to think that um, our neighbors are our first responders in many respects. Um, and we're building that community power and cohesion in response to our climate crisis. Um, so it, we're a little different than traditional citizen science in that respect. Um, we make our space appeal to as many people as possible around these three themes. We are creating a public record of the lived experience of climate change. Uh, we're building awareness and evidence uh, for local climate um, concerns as well as solutions. Um, the data that we're providing is critical um, and we work with partners in the public infrastructure space, policy space or education space. Um, and so again, we're taking, you know, we're not exactly specifically saying, okay, publishing papers is the result of our work. Um, so how do you use IC Change? Um, it's pretty easy, um, like any number of uh, social media apps or citizen science apps. Um, but what we do is we surface topics that we know are meaningful to you. Specifically, if we have an investigation in your community, it's the first thing that, one that appears at the very top. Um, and we try and, um, and then you will see calls to action, ways to measure things that are specific to you in your community. But we don't have a specific investigation launched in Australia. However, we do and have hosted IC Changers in Australia since 2014. Um, and we care very much about Australia as citizen scientists. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a few of the posts, a handful that have really been indicative of the trends that we've seen in this last decade, an unprecedented decade. Um, so this is one of our first posts from Australia in uh, 2016. And uh, this was early in the massive El Nino event that you all probably might remember. And I do ask the audience to think through, okay, so some of these events, are they present or have they, we already forgotten them? And I'll say this with regards to the social science with, uh, of climate change. We don't remember, we adapt quite quickly to these um, impacts because we're human beings and that's our greatest advantage and also our greatest vulnerability. So for any of you in the audience, this I wouldn't need to kind of think through like, do you remember this? Was this part of your experience in the last few years? Um, this um, was kind of El, the El Nino cycles in, in Australia, you guys are surrounded by the ocean. So you are experiencing changes at a global level and a trend level that are worth paying attention to. Um, around the world. That same year, we saw an incredible heavy rain events um, in areas that weren't used to experiencing them. Um, and we do know that as we warm their oceans, we get these extreme rain cycles coming in. There's more energy and yet more, more evapotranspiration. Um, we see the same, we saw similar things all around the United States and the world this particular year. Um, 
soon after we saw an early spring. Um, an early spring is one of the earliest signs um, that you have uh, in a runaway uh, drought season or wildfire season. And it's something that we track on the, in our database and pay attention to. And we do not need to talk to Australians about drought. Y'all know more about drought problems than most people. Um, so we appreciate it. It's been an intense few years. Um, in that regard, we've been getting quite a bit of posts about long-term impacts of drought in Australia. Um, and, and the impacts with regards to food, with regards to farmers, with regards to ranchers, and naturally, of course, with regards to wildfires. Um, so we have seen an uptick from this particular area that we know have been experiencing the, most, the, the virulent wildfires in the, um, this last year, in 2019. Um, and, and the kind of, kind of, if I were to summarize these, the kinds of things that we're seeing consistently from our Australian community. These are all critical. Um, and it's not a disaster scroll. This is not about like saying, okay, we're just going to sit here and, and suffer together, which there is value in that. But there, the data that we do collect around climate experiences matter. And, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit why um, and how we've used the data in the United States to inform infrastructure solutions. Now, of course, we would love to be doing this in Australia. So keep that in mind as I walk through some of these examples. Um, the major problem is that when we think about climate change and we try and start to solve around it, we're often using modeled data. And I don't care if it's the next generation satellite or sensor, those data models are making mistakes and our lives and our infrastructure and our local community's ability to adapt are on the line. And particularly in their missing context that is uniquely provided by communities who are living with these experiences over time. Um, and again, I don't know how y'all do it in, in Australia, but in, in Europe, in the United States, we have these meetings that nobody in the public attends because civic activity is a luxury. Uh, unlike, you know, you know, that's why we're trying to democratize science. Well, let me tell you, we need to democratize civic decision making just as much. Um, and when we don't have people who are experiencing climate change in their daily lives at the table making decisions, then we're missing critical details. And those details can be provided, whether it's somebody hosting a sensor, whether it's somebody telling us a story about these impacts and then networking the information together. That's what we're after with IC change. And this is how we've used some of the data. We have communities in uh, coastal New Jersey who keep track of tidal king, event, king tide events, which happening one, one happening right now. Um, and they're tracking it with rain gauges as well as kind of marking the tides and seeing that very moderate events are causing massive flooding. Um, and they're also seeing, we're seeing that they're mobilizing around infrastructure solutions. They're using IC change to document those solutions when those things work and when they don't. And then they're actually advocating for other towns close by to do the same. It's really a very organic community led initiative. Um, but then we do work um, as well on heat. Uh, this was a work we did in Harlem where we put sensors inside people's apartments and documented urban heat and public housing. Um, and we modeled the first indoor urban heat wave and, and published that work at, in the EMS bulletin here in the US. Um, we discovered that the policy wasn't right with regards to ACs in public housing and that people were sneaking ACs into their apartments to avoid fees. So it's critical missing information when it comes to designing urban heat policies. Um, in New Orleans, we actually used the data, the technical data, to change infrastructure designs. Uh, this was, we documented 29 flood events and one of the most well-known resilience infrastructure initiatives in the United States. And uh, we actually doubled the flood capacity of a stormwater infrastructure design because the models were underestimating the, the impacts of, of rain events in this area. Um, it doesn't get as much attention because it doesn't have a lot of high value real estate. And so we were able to mobilize the community and do a lot with, with data um, and, and really have physical impact. We added $5 million to this worth of, of infrastructure um, capacity to this project. Um, we also work in the idea that where can we, you know, when we talk about censoring, when we talk about sensing, um, a lot of the uh, kind of the ideas of where to place sensors, how to monitor our environment at scale, we really don't have very good information about where we should place things. So we actually have an experiment where we're trying to use citizen science data on IC change to inform the placement of a flood infrastructure sensor network um, in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. 
uh, and working uh, kind of that one has had obviously we're a digital virtual tool so you, anyone can use this anywhere but kickstarting we'd love to always start with people right so that one we are uh, coming back to next year um, but this is how you add quantitative data alongside your qualitative data on IC change you can do that for our storms and flooding investigations We've added qualitative, quantitative data to our wildfire and air quality investigations, and we recently um, have been working on urban heat. Uh, and we really are impressed with how little terribly inexpensive sensors can actually do a lot of information gathering, um, because these things are not professionally calibrated, but they're calibrated them to themselves. And that man's apartment in, um, in New Orleans does not, uh, is hotter on the inside than it is on the outside. And that's what that picture is demonstrating a little bit there. Um, we have uh, users across 118 countries. So even if we don't have an active investigation, quote unquote, or a partner in your area, we still are hosting a global conversation. And our team actively reports out the trends uh, and the experiences and the data that are being collected. Um, we have someone in Tokyo who has been using IC Change Freeform to document smog. Um, and we really do believe in the power of co-creation with our community to develop the methods that make the most sense. Um, I'm going to end uh, with one of our my favorite uh, IC changers, actually, in doing the research and what we've been post seeing from Australia. Um, this, um, this is an actually really beautiful writer. Uh, and she has her own blog and, I, and beautiful, beautiful stories, but she shares excerpts of her experiences of her life on IC Change. And I thought I'd read that uh, before we go into our discussion. Um, let's see, gray strike thrushes, the pair that live on my mountain already had a bond of chicks last September in the Australian spring. Though April is mid autumn here, the same two birds have made another nest with three eggs in our garage in a toolbox of spiky rivets. Due to three years of drought, the worst bushfires in modern history and subsequent local flooding, everything is lush and green like it is spring. Mid-autumn is a few days, is in a few days, and there are birds nesting, butterflies and caterpillars everywhere in this crazy second spring. The environment is changing. Birds, animals, insects, reptiles are confused and they think it's spring because it's green once again. And I don't know if the thrush chicks will survive April's cooler weather six months on from the first brood and at the wrong time of year, but somehow I hope they will grow up and fly away to come back and annoy me singing at 6 a.m. with a melodious tune in the pre-dawn. I've been self-isolating in my farm for two weeks. My view is the view in this garage of a pair mated for life, doing their best to bring new life into the world while they can. And if you think being holed up in an apartment is confining, try sitting on a small nest for three weeks straight. Therese Raced and Tamworth. Um, so I am inspired every day by what I read on IC Change. And that is one of the greatest assets about it. Um, so in the world where we're all trying to be smart and we're trying to figure out how to make sense of 21st century climate change, we believe wholeheartedly that the smartest sensor is still you, is still me. It's still, it's like everybody on this call right now. So we really invite you to join us uh, on IC Change. Um, we're ICChange.org, Google Play, all the things. Um, and please get in touch directly if you're interested in working with us. We're community at ICChange.org. Thanks so much.